Hello, hello. <clears throat> Long in time and no stream. You want to see the pizza? Well, I have just taken a slice out and put it on a plate, but the rest of the pizza. Let me see. We need to make sure we get a good, good pizza angle. Oh, without it falling. Ah, it's falling. That's the pizza. Yeah, this is going to be a mostly gaming stream. Um, I thought about doing a programming stream today, and I'm just not totally feeling like it, but it's been a long time since we did a programming stream, so I should probably do one tomorrow. What do you think about that? This pizza has so much garlic. Do people drop pizzas on IRL streams? Is that what they do? It's officially a work holiday for us because we're taking the Monday off, but I don't really follow the usual schedule most of the time. I uh, don't think they made the pizza I asked for. This pizza is not the right pizza. I don't think. It's fine. I will eat it. Oh, maybe it is. I don't remember. I just picked one of the previous pizzas that I'd ordered. So I'd get that again. I should do more programs like the slideshow one. No, because if I do more programs, then every one of them will be even less done. You want things to go toward being finished. There are a fair amount of tomatoes on top. There's a lot of onions inside this pizza, actually, too. Where's the pizza from? OK, so most pizza in San Francisco is not that good. The best pizza is Zachary's Pizza in Berkeley. Uh, that is not what this is because that's too far. This is Little Star Pizza on Valencia Street, which is not as good as Zachary's, but in a pinch, it's an okay substitute. There's also a Little Star on Divisadero. How is the cheese? It's cheesy. How's it going? Things are pretty good. You're from New York. You had pizza in, in LA and you were appalled. Dude, New Yorkers can't say anything about pizza. All right. I lived in New York for a year. I tried a lot of different pizza. New York pizza is really bad, except for a couple places. Okay. All of this thing that New Yorkers have about like our pizza is really good because of the water or whatever. It's not true. It's these bad doughy slices of low quality ingredients. Sorry. That's just how it is. 
I'm not going to, I don't know what pizza you had in LA, so I can't say whether that was good or not, but New York pizza is not good. Um, I do when, every time I go to New York, I do have to go to two boots and get a slice of Mr. Pink if they have it. It's not really good pizza, but I just like it for, it's the best bad pizza in New York. There are a couple of upscale pizza places in New York that are all right. But like regular New York pizza is just bad, bad. And I know because I ate a lot of it. Um, supposedly they did fix the sound in Call of Duty, but uh, they also took the nine bang out, which I think dead silence is a much bigger problem than the nine bang, so I kind of question that. I kind of feel like maybe they're doing the Valve School of Game Design, which is just acquiesce to whoever yells the loudest and make the changes they say, which is not really a good way to design a game. I'm not sure, though. Not sure. Brooklyn pizza. Do you mean pizza anywhere in Brooklyn or do you mean a specific pizza place called Brooklyn pizza? Because I've definitely had just slices of pizza in Brooklyn and they weren't any better than slices of pizza in Manhattan. Um, the pizza places I remember being good were Lombardi's and John's, but I don't know if either of those or both still exist. Uh, this is not a programming stream. We just haven't started the Call of Duty yet because I'm still finishing pizza. There's a style of pizza called Brooklyn pizza, namely Spumoni Gardens. It's a lighter dough, sweeter sauce, and fresh mozzarella. Okay. Next time I'm back out there, I will try to get that. I mean, fresh mozzarella sounds good to me because that's one of my biggest problems with the regular New York slice of pizza is all the cheap quality cheese that's like piled on there, like frozen, frozen ass slices of cheese like you bought at the grocery store or not slices, but grated. Yeah, it's not good. How am I? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Which John's Bleecker? Uh, it might have been on Bleecker Street. Somewhere around there. I don't remember, dude. It was a long time ago that I lived in New York, all right? It was like 15 years ago. <laughs> so this information may be outdated.
dude, people are prime subbing. Awesome. Thanks, guys. John's at Bleecker is still there and considered one of the best places. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Who is taller, me or Casey? Uh, I never thought about it. Which probably means we're at least close to the same height, right? Like if someone is a lot shorter than you, then you'll notice it. And if someone is a lot taller than you, then you'll notice it. Um, I know for sure Jeff is way taller than me though, and I don't really think about that either. So maybe what I just said is wrong. What would my game programming school be like? Uh, I, I don't know. It would definitely be not a semester by semester kind of thing. It would be more like a martial arts school where you like pass through different grades or, or uh, you know, like belt colors or what. We wouldn't do belts because you don't want to be like trying to pretend to be a kung fu school. Although maybe that would be fun. Um, but uh, it would be something like that where you're going at your pace. That's sort of the most important thing. Um, and then uh, there, would be, there would be freedom in the way that you chose to proceed and what you want to do. What language should you begin or start with? I really don't have a good recommendation. I mean, for very beginners, like, play Zachtronics games, and then after that, I don't actually know. Will there be in official instructions tutorials? Yes, there will. Do I have any interest in Battlefield 5? Well, the only game modes that I've seen in Battlefield 5 are the deathmatch, capture a control point, run around like a chicken and die every 10 seconds modes. And I'm not, those are boring. I don't know why people keep making them. Um, so if that's the main multiplayer, then I am probably not gonna play it. If they have something else, then maybe. Have I played the hex? Yes, I played it over my birthday break. With Casey and some other people. Is there a limit on the number of parameters you should pass to a function? I got a slight reprimand for passing six parameters. They suggested you put all the parameters into an object and pass that. Uh, there is a point at which it becomes bananas how many arguments you're passing, but six is not that point.
Like, it only makes sense to put things into a struct like that if, it, that, if that same struct is going to be used by more than one routine, right? Like, if you, if you legitimately need seven parameters, and there's really not a simpler way to interface with the outside program, then putting those parameters into a struct is just making things more complicated because you, you still have seven parameters. Passing them takes more syntax and more runtime performance. And you have this extra concept of this struct that people seeing it have to wonder, like, what's that for? And then they have to go figure it out. So it's strictly worse to have a struct than to have seven parameters, unless that struct really is some concept that recurs in the program and really should exist. Now, it might be that of your six or seven parameters, maybe four of them do make sense in a struct, and then you might think about that. But it's this idea that there's a maximum number of parameters and above that is just bad is nonsense. It's nonsense. Like, if you're going to make a, a one-use struct and pass it to a procedure just to give parameters, then that's exactly what passing parameters on the stack is in C. It's creating an anonymous struct for you with no syntactic overhead and very little compile overhead. So it, that sounds to me like it's in the neighborhood of, of bad programming advice uh, and that the people giving you adv that advice probably aren't necessarily uh, the most thoughtful programmers. But it is true that if you get a lot of, uh, hold on. It is true that if you have a lot of program, uh, a lot of parameters, um, you should at least double check if you really need them, right? Like any time it gets long, you should it should be a, a reminder to go back to it and look at it and say, okay, do I really need to do this this way? But if the answer is yes, that's the simplest way to do it. Then do it that way. I don't, I don't like the fact that Insobot spams. It distracts me. I'm trying to talk to someone and I see a nonsense message. It's just adding noise to the channel. So, uh, yeah, I will, I will straight up ban Insobot if spamming doesn't get turned off, frankly. Predictions on AI replacing programming jobs. I think that'll happen a lot later than AI replacing other jobs. So programmers are the least worried. Thanks for the happy birthday sub. Now, definitely there are categories of so-called programming that probably will go away, but not because of AI, just because we're doing a lot of stupid crap. Like 80% of web programming jobs are not doing anything interesting, right? And there's just so much money being paid out for that stuff that it's got to be the case that all this stuff will get simplified and people will start deploying systems that require less web programming to get things done. Um, so I think, I think web programmers, uh, I mean, web programming is going to be around for a long time, but the number of web programmers required is going to drop. I think we're at peak web programmer right now, uh, but that's not an AI issue. That's just, there was a big bubble. And so everybody just hired really fast to get in the bubble, right? Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of AI threatening jobs in the way that people normally think about, there's a lot of jobs going to go before programming does, before serious programming does.
Yeah, it's you know, so it's a good analogy. Way back in the in the early '90s, let's say, there were all these GUI toolkits that you would use to make a desktop application, and then you know, Sun Microsystems and Microsoft and all these people started making GUI based systems where you would just like open a window and drag the buttons and then say, okay, I want that. And it would output the C plus plus code or whatever that would create those buttons. Right. Um, now it turns out those APIs were probably way more annoying than they should have been in the first place. But nevertheless, uh, you had this situation where, where people were doing a lot of work that was really unnecessary, right? Like a, a process improvement got rid of most of that work. Now, there, weren't, there wasn't this giant glut of UI programmers the way that there's a giant glut of JavaScript programmers, but um, you could imagine something very similar happening for web pages. Yeah, you know what? I always call things early. I always call stock market stuff early. So if I say we're at peak JavaScript, we probably aren't for like two years. That's that's probably true. Um, but yeah, we're, we're in the neighborhood of that. If you want something that really stands out and is different creative, you'll probably need to do something that none of those tools can do for you. That is true, right? But then people are going to have to pay that cost. And just like in video games, how everybody would rather uh, use Unity than spend the time and effort on their own engine, same thing will happen with web pages. All right. So when modernizing one of those drag and drop desktop programs, you want to, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not claiming those are good programs. I'm just saying they saved a lot of work. Um, like I hate, like I, I haven't ever really used the Microsoft one because I hate the way all that stuff works with the, the .rc files and stuff. Uh, but the, the Sun, I saw the Sun Microsystems way and it was not that different. And... It was super annoying because, you know, you push the button and they define all these constants and you can't ever serialize the constants because they might change. Um, it was kind of stupid. Like you can't, you couldn't by default save in a file which item in a, in a checkbox list was checked because, or a radio button list, let's say, because that has only one. Because if you change the radio button list, then that integer may no longer be the right integer. It was super stupid. Um, yeah. There's tons and tons of people running out to get these web jobs, but they aren't really interested in learning how to program well. You graduated a little while ago, and there were people in your senior capstone class didn't know that Java and JavaScript were different languages. Yeah, totally. This is always what happens when a bubble is so big that it won't self-sustain anymore. Because once the input becomes very low quality, uh, just things start to fall apart. So it's like, it's like the 1920s. I forget who said it, right? But there's a famous quote about the Great Depression where a guy was like... Um, I got out of the stock market once my shoeshine boy started asking me about stock picks, right? Because you're like, oh my God, the entire market is being driven by people who have no idea about, about how companies work, you know? Um, and so we're kind of at that point in terms of programming. Like most programming is being done by people who have no idea how computers work. It's not it's not good for long-term stability of the system, right? Which engine is better, Unreal or Frostbite? I, I don't know enough about Frostbite, and the last time I used Unreal, 
was 17 years ago, 16 years ago. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, the absolute terror people express toward manual memory management. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, yes, it's possible to make mistakes when you manually manage memory, but you know what? You can fix those bugs. And uh, it's even not that hard if you have good tools. So, yeah. In fact, it's not even just absolute terror only. It's you get the hacker news kids with the attitude like, oh my God, I can't believe you're such a bad programmer that you manually manage memory. Like maybe that's the flip coin of, the, of being afraid. It's like copying an attitude so that you don't have to look like you're afraid or something. I don't know. Yeah, people cannot do cost-benefit analysis. That is true. The even worse thing, though, is people rarely are trying to do cost-benefit analysis. They just do listing benefits. That's what people do. They say, I want to do thing X because benefit A, benefit B, and benefit C. I mean, that's every... even, And I can't blame them too much because the entire discipline is corrupt. Like, I, I made a passive-aggressive tweet about computer science yesterday or something... Like most computer science papers, you know, there's, there's a point when you're talking about how cool your algorithm is that you have to list previous work. And part of the reason you list it is to say why your thing is better than what already existed. And again, whenever people do that, it's like, oh, let's, let's show all the problems with all the previous work, not that charitably. And we're not going to, we're not going to think that hard about the sources of these problems and whether they're actually deep problems. And then we're going to list our thing and we're not going to, we're not going to say that much about the problems in our thing. In fact, we don't want to know what the problems in our thing are. We're just going to list the benefits of our thing, right? That's like 99% of computer science research papers written in the past 20 years and they're all garbage. Like it's, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. Not sure you can square the circle on MM is not that hard with all new devs suck and web sucks. You want the same JS devs doing memory management? No, I don't, unless they learn how computers work, right? I mean, both of those things can be true. For somebody who knows how to program, memory management is not that hard and not that scary. Absolutely, right? Um, and yes, most people entering the field are not really competent programmers by the standards of prior years, right? <clears throat> like by, by the standards of when I graduated from college, none of these programmers would get hired, you know? Um, Yeah, it's, it's bad. It's a bad situation. On Handmade Hero of URS, KCY, I had recommended against using standard I.O. functions. Casey suggested asking me, but he noted that you can call create file with many more degrees of freedom than F open. Is that why I recommend against standard I.O.? Um, well, I don't, I don't blanket recommend against standard IO. That might have been a misunderstanding or something. Like certainly, okay, there's, there's different situations. One situation is you're writing a program, you want to open a file and read it. Uh, I think using fopen there is probably fine, okay? Different situation, you're making an API that other people need to use or, or a, like a library, which is probably where somebody saw this, right? Probably somebody was watching a compiler stream and I was working on some of the IO file operation stuff uh, like I was doing a couple months ago and I wasn't using standard IO. And then the question is why not? And the answer is, well, 
you don't want to build software that's wrappers around wrappers around wrappers, okay? And on Windows, at least, standard I.O. is just a compatibility wrapper for the OS native stuff. And the OS native stuff does give you more information. So, first of all, well, oh, and, and then there's a, there's, a, there's a broader scale thing, which is just, we want to ship our libraries without requiring libc as a dependency, right? Which you would need to uh, if, if you use standard IO, right? Um, so these are all, I mean, uh, hopefully I don't have to talk repetitively about all that. Like, hopefully those things make sense. Um, you know, if, if you use fopen and that just calls create file underneath, then obviously you're taking some unknown amount of inefficiency for using that wrapper. Um, and w so why, right? May maybe a good enough answer is because I want to call fopen the same everywhere and not think about it. But at some point that falls apart anyway. Like as soon as you want to do anything sophisticated, that kind of thing starts to fall apart. So um, in general, in video games, the way we do it is we code to the platform wherever we touch the platform, you know? Um, that doesn't mean we don't call stuff like fopen. We probably call fopen on the witness, maybe. Maybe we don't. Maybe we do in some cases and not in others. Maybe we do only in developer mode. I don't know. Um, but I don't, I wouldn't go to people and say, hey, don't ever use fopen, right? It's situational. Uh, use it if it makes sense. Don't use it if it doesn't make sense. You think the overall quality has gone down, but they are requested to know so much more that gaining deep knowledge is discouraged. Why learn C++ now the computer actually works when you'll be working at a company which doesn't even use C++, so you use C Sharp, and knowledge of the CPU doesn't actually help you that much. Well, it really does, though. <laughs> it really does help you. Um, I agree that that's the reasoning why this happens, but I don't agree that it's true. JavaScript or blockchain, yeah. Less qualified, but more experienced in general in terms of time spent preparing for a job. Yeah, but you know, I always think there's a stark difference between shallow knowledge and deep knowledge, right? And shallow knowledge is stuff that is only going to be true for a few years. And deep knowledge is stuff that will be true for a long time or possibly forever. Um, and it used to be that the programmer was the guy who learned deep knowledge and then the system administrator did the shallow knowledge, right? Now, most JavaScript programmers are essentially system administrators. Like, they're people who, uh, who do some programming, but mostly their job is about understanding all the weird... Uh, all the weird aspects of interfacing with specific systems, right? Specific programs, specific operating systems, and so forth, right? That didn't used to be what a programmer did. So um, I agree that there is knowledge there, but I don't, think it's, I don't think it's particularly deep knowledge that leads to doing particularly good work. It's just things that help you hack through the jungle with your machete for a few months until you need to learn more of them, you know?
Have Odin and Zig influenced development? No, I, they're doing their thing and I'm doing my thing. I honestly don't have time to pay attention to what other people are doing. Um, I mean, maybe I will at some point, but I just my to-do list for the near future is filled out. So uh, I got I to gotta get some more work done in terms of features before I start uh, start paying attention to what other people are doing. <clears throat> You're in your last year of a CS bachelor. Is there anything I'd recommend to learn to become a good programmer? Um, just try to do ambitious projects. And when things don't go as well as you thought they would, pay attention to why. <clears throat> because it's that part, paying attention to why things didn't work out and understanding the real reason why and then iterating on that and trying something different next time. And then observing how the, the iteration works and comparing and improving. That's the important skill, right? Self-improvement is the important skill. Uh, that'll very rapidly let you bypass even people with much more programming experience who haven't developed that skill. So uh, super important. Yeah, avoiding ideology in programming is another way to put it, right? Like when you're just beginning, it's totally fine to hear all these recommendations that people have, like you shouldn't pass more than five arguments to a function, right? Or you shouldn't have global variables or whatever, right? That's all fine when you don't know anything. Uh, but as soon as you start programming for real, you should be constantly evaluating what you think you know and modifying it based on your experience, right? And that's what most people don't actually do. So, uh, or they don't do very well. Right, just keep in mind all that coding philosophy stuff that everybody is so eager to tell you just gets you started. You're never gonna be like, you know, the Kung Fu Grandmaster equivalent of a programmer by following those rules, because those rules are made by people who are not themselves the equivalent of a Kung Fu Grandmaster programmer, right? They're made by people, I don't know. I don't, I, I, I don't wanna say, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm in danger of like dissing specific people and I don't wanna do that, but, um, Everyone I know who is really good and has a lot of experience and most importantly can build complicated software that many people would just not be able to build. All of those people uh, program based on their built up experience of what they know works. And uh, that's a very complicated, it's, first of all, it's different for every person. Everybody's going to have a different idea about that. But secondly, <clears throat> it would take forever to explain. Like if I were to try to sit down and explain all the ideas that make up my concept of how I should program well, First of all, I don't even know how to do that because all those things are so buried deep in the brain that I would have to dig them out somehow. And then secondly, it would take frickin' forever. I don't know how many weeks it would take, but it would take at least weeks of nonstop talking, probably more than a month, <laughs> to really explain all these things. And then the explanation wouldn't do any good because people don't really listen to advice. People listen to simple advice and not complex, nuanced advice, right? And, and everything that really is effective is complex and nuanced. Like the, even that F open thing that we just asked about, it's like, it's a complex and nuanced issue, right? I'm not saying don't use F open, but I'm saying I wouldn't use it in that situation where I didn't use it. So, um, yeah. think you heard in one stream that I dislike Halloween culture. Can I give a quick explanation why? It's just 
a personal thing of mine. You know, it's not. It's not something that I would generalize like every, you know, everybody has something based on how they grew up that they like or don't like that doesn't generalize to other people. And that's probably one of them. Is it possible to get an early release version of the compiler? Uh, maybe eventually, but not yet. We're still, we haven't done direct compiler work in a little bit because we've been working on the game. And uh, I keep saying any week now I'm switching back to the compiler and that's still true. Any week now I'm switching back to the compiler. Why are job descriptions overdone? You've gotten jobs that require six plus years programming and been programming only three years. I don't know, man. Um, it's complicated. <laughs> How do you deal with lack of motiv motivation? I have an entire video on YouTube, as somebody told you. Yeah. How would I implement a global console variable system where you can call the variable name in code? Um, not that differently from how I do. So in Sokoban right now, we don't have exactly that, but I mean, well, we have two things. So we have one thing, which is we have this set of variables <clears throat> where uh, these are in a text file and you can tweak the text file and it'll auto reload it. Right, and these can be scalars or vectors or booleans, right? I think also strings, but there might not be any. Oh, there are strings in this file. Um, so I, th there probably are enough videos on YouTube to show you how this was done, because I'm pretty sure I live streamed it. Um, now this doesn't have a graphical interface, right? Um, the thing that's hooked up to the console is we have, commands, right? That's a slightly different thing. Uh, but you know, we have command procedures that get introspected and registered. Um, so I can go level heroes 12, whoops. Is it? Oh, no, heroes 1, 12. You know, and so these are, these are automatically detected in the program as well. Um, so we, we auto detect procedures. Uh, these are by auto introspecting data structures. Um, and so the only remaining thing, like if you wanted to be able to graphically tweak these, it's just straightforward GUI tweaker stuff, you know, and we have, we have all this stuff where we live, live tweak variables, like here's all a bunch of Booleans. Ah, I can click them and here's, uh, here's some vector values and whoops. So you would just hook those two things together. A lot of this is on YouTube and, you know, explaining how it works right now would be a little bit redundant and I'm going to go play blackout really, but, uh, you know, it's, it's all there, I think. Why don't I like decibels? Because nobody knows what they mean without using them a long time. And there's no reason for them because everybody in every other discipline uses more reasonable units, right? Like what's wrong with saying times 10 to the whatever? Everybody knows what that means. To make it worse, there's multiple different flavors of decibel, right? Like what does negative five decibels mean? Nobody knows what the hell that means. Just say how much sound energy there is like in every other discipline. 
what sorts of things are still to do. Uh, I've got to work on the library system and then the macro system. And those are the last two big features. Didn't hear me talk about management styles. Do I have any thoughts on the interaction between engineering and business? Uh, no, I mean, my company is very management light, possibly sometimes to people's chagrin because they would like more direction sometimes maybe, but uh, I just can't be bothered. <laughs> Um, being better at management is not really a thing that I focus on primarily. I mean, I work on it a little bit because you have to work on everything, but um, we're just worried about getting our software done. Massive frame drops. Let me check OBS. Oh, okay. Let me, uh, let me exit the game. See if it has to do with the game. No, it's just Comcast being bad. I don't know what to say about this. Maybe I have to quit Comcast. The new Gmail. Um, Yeah, I don't know why Google makes everything worse all the time. Dude, we're only getting 2K per second. How long has this been going on? Am I gonna not be able to play Blackout because of the frame drops? Should I like restart my modem and hope it gets better? Because I was about to start playing soon. Now it's still happening though is the problem. Like the game is closed and OBS is telling me about lots of drop frames. 8% frame loss. What's up with the trend towards big and bulky like the Blackout UI? Well, the Blackout UI is designed for consoles. So it's designed for you're sitting far away from the TV and there's a tidal safe region of 10% around the border that you can't use because consoles are stupid. So um, you take those two things into account and you have all this HUD in the middle of the screen that's large. So that's going to happen for any console game that's ported to PC is going to be like that, unfortunately. Uh, should I just try restarting OBS and kick the stream here? I don't know what to do. Can I please name a few of the best programming books? Uh, I don't really know any good programming books. I'm sorry. I ate a bunch of pizza already. I'm going to try rebooting the modem and restarting the stream. So the stream is going to go down probably for like a minute. No, because if I lower, I'm getting two kilobytes per second. If I try to play blackout at that data rate, it's just going to be a blur. It's going to be awful. Um, so I will try restarting the modem. And uh, the stream hopefully will be back up in about a minute. Why would someone want to run code within the compiler? Uh, the demo where I do compile time execution talks all about that on YouTube. And then the other, there's a later video where I expand on that and I do stuff like the, the Misra automotive standard safety checks and stuff. Um, maybe somebody can link that one. Uh, okay, I'm restarting my modem. Back in a minute. 